Warhammer 3 has 24 factions with about nine to 10 factions that nearly solely and completely rely on some form of strong frontline and powerful melee units. So it's incredibly important to know exactly how to bash, beat, and maim your way into Gork's heart. Now, I haven't used or even seen all the melee units in the game with over 200 plus units and more coming in every DLC. It's hard to keep in mind every single different combination or possibility. So instead, this is going to be a general pattern of how to use infantry, where to use them, what to worry about, and how to pair them up with their best possible counters. To start, we're going to group up our melee units into some pretty important categories just to cover basic explanations on what each category is and when you might want to use them. So there are a couple different main types. To start, there's your standard normal infantry, something like these shielded marauders in the Warriors of Chaos. Generally, these are just medium to high model count units that are good in melee combat with some mix of melee defense and melee attack. They'd be considered your standard frontline holder and just your standard unit to make up a lot of the early game or mid game composition of your frontline. Next up, we have anti-large, which is similar in nature to your average frontline unit. A more advanced version of these is these Halberd Chaos Warriors. Basically, it's similar to the other troops, except that they get a bonus versus large entities, and they usually have some sort of brace or charge reflection that can counter cavalry charges or ogre charges. They actually, compared to a normal infantry unit, they actually have reduced melee attack and melee defense stats. So you're essentially trading out raw stat damage for an anti-large specific bonus or anti-charge specific bonus. So you wouldn't want these to take up your entire army, but can be a good supporting unit. Next up is anti-infantry. Anti-infantry, for example, would be like the halberds in the empire. They get a bonus melee attack in defense versus infantry units as opposed to large units, and they're typically built out in a way where they only really do well against other infantry and any other unit they would do worse. Good for holding down a front line and countering other large groups of infantry units, but not very good for a more diverse army. Me. Next up is elite infantry. For example, these would be like the, this would be like my chosen of Zinch. They don't have any specific bonuses necessarily, or even a label calling them elite infantry, but you can just consider them any sort of upper mid to late game melee infantry troop. They're usually going to have good melee attack, good melee defense, and high armor, and hopefully they're shielded as well. These will be troops that typically in most armies you won't have a lot of, but the couple that you do have will be able to go 1v3, 1v2, other infantry units on their own pretty much holding the line for quite a long time and hopefully getting a couple units knocked out so you can snowball the fight. Next up you have armor piercing units. Our halberds actually have this as well. Basically it just means that a portion of their attack damage or all of their attack damage is armor piercing which means that it ignores the armor values of different troops allowing you to do more damage against troops that are heavily armored. This is specifically good against elite infantry as any sort of normal marauder chosen with without armor piercing is not going to be able to get through the armor and do significantly less damage than they normally would. You also want to keep in mind that some of these troops are going to have shields as well. Your spearmen, your halberds, and your greatswords, which are typically your armor piercing, your anti-infantry, and anti-large units, typically won't have shields. They're usually two-handed weapons, or you might end up with dual weapons, which also can't have a shield, obviously, as implied. But for your standard infantry and elite infantry, shields are extremely important. These will determine a percent chance of all small arms fire not hitting the unit. So in this case for this silver shield, it's the highest ranked shield in the game. You get a block of 60% for all small arm fire from the front of the unit. There's other ones. The Marauders here have, they have a high tier bronze shield, which puts them at 35% of all small arms fire. This is incredibly important, especially for melee focused factions. It allows you to push up on the front line without needing to worry about archers as much, allowing your troops to get into battle without taking as much damage as they normally would have. Moving on to the question of when exactly you use infantry, well, they're the backbone or foundation of your entire army, so they're going to be used always, ideally, unless you are Kislev and you only have hybrid units, until the show is a change update. Essentially, the goal of the infantry is to do one of two things. Either you have some form of artillery or range, and they just need to be a wall. You won't get past the suck! 
just a wall to exist, to hold position, to not move, to not let any enemies pass, and to defend your archers while they dish out damage until they die and until your archers die. That's sort of the default for most factions, what the front lines are used for. They're not typically going to get the most kills. Usually they're just delaying time for your archers to do damage. In something more like Warriors of Chaos, your front line is both doing damage and holding out time. So you usually have stronger front lines compared to the other factions, but they also will hold out time for something like cavalry, chariots, monstrous infantry, and single entity monsters to make their way into the fight and deal damage while your main infantry takes the brunt of the damage, allowing your other troops to hammer an anvil or deal damage at the same time, hopefully allowing you to break through their front line and take and get rid of their archers. So to recap, you're defending and delaying time for your ranged attacks to do damage, or you're delaying and buying time for your cavalry and special units to do damage. They're basically just a wall to hold out as long as possible, and if they happen to win, that's great, but that's their core use. Now there's a couple things you'll need to worry about when dealing with infantry, so you'll still need to keep an eye out and look to micromanage them here and there to make sure that you're getting the most out of them as you can. Specifically, this comes down to your special unique units, such as your halberds, your spears, and your great weapons. There's going to be essentially a rock, paper, scissor game going on, where if the enemy has a large unit, a single entity monster, monstrous infantry, cavalry, you want to send your halberds up on your flank or pushing those units to make sure that you get your anti-large damage bonuses off and that you can take out those units before they wipe out your normal infantry. On that note, you have anti-infantry troops or damage dealing troops, which you'll want to send out and make sure that they're supporting one of your frontline units in damage. So you'll have a frontline unit that is typically weaker, like let's say our marauders, and then we'll send in that are shielded as well. And we'll send them ahead to take the brunt of the damage as we don't mind losing those troops. And we send in our damage dealers who typically will have less melee defense than an equivalent unit. That's just a normal infantry unit. And you'll have them come in and support that unit instead of going in on their own. Damage dealers and anti-infantry, of course, are countering infantry. So you'll pair them up with a weaker infantry unit of your own to try and take out their infantry. Last Lastly, you have armor piercing. So the whole point of armor piercing is to deal more damage to armored units. So if you happen to have any armor piercing units, you need to send them after elite infantry on the enemy army or anyone you can find who's heavily armored so that you can deal extra damage to them and you're not sending a unit out to basically become fodder. So you'll have to make sure that you micromanage these specific types of infantry so that you're pairing them up with proper battles and you're essentially winning these little mini rock, paper, scissor battles where you have, if you're against infantry, you want to send in anti-infantry or damage dealers. If you're against any sort of cavalry, chariot, monster, monstrous infantry, send out your anti-large units at them. And if there's any elite infantry in the enemy army, you want to focus your armor piercing units over to them. And then typically, composition wise, you'll want your army to have about 60 to 70 percent being some form of normal or elite infantry. And then you want 30 to 40 percent of your army being some sort of supportive unit, such as anti-large or anti-infantry, so you can have some flexibility on what unit types you're countering from the enemy army. Things you'll always need to make sure to watch out for when dealing with infantry and worrying about your front line is that they're always weak to artillery, range, magic, lords, chariots, monsters, and cav. It's a good chunk of units and any one of those will typically deal a ton of damage to your infantry units, cause problems for your front lines, and possibly break through. So you want to be micromanaging your troops to make sure that they're taking optimal fights and that you're avoiding taking unnecessary damage from things like artillery range damage and not grouping things up to get hit by magic spells for example. On that note I can quickly go over some formation stuff. So the most optimal way to set up infantry in a front line is you have basically a wide set formation for the most part. The actual width of your armies could probably a bit be a bit narrower as this increases the weight value of your troops so things like monstrous cavalry and chariots will get stuck in the middle of the troops instead of barreling right through into your back line. The reason you want a wide set army is it gives you the option option to have more flexibility in the middle of a fight because if the enemy is sending their whole front line what's available to them against these four troops covering a huge portion of the map you will have a huge section of army to move up and flank around the enemy allowing you to move your troops around to support portions of your front line that are weaker
attacker or counter certain units that might be looking to flank you'll want to have your core front line in in the middle and then you'll want to have your supportive front lines off to the sides usually defending the flanks of these units as typically you'll have cavalry and monsters or pounds flanking the sides of your army so having anti-large is extremely helpful for that and charge defense there are of course a couple other caveats and mentions you want to make sure that there's enough space between armies that you're not bunched up too much so that you can move certain units out if need be and they don't get stuck in fights that are not to their advantage and then you'll want to create space for any archers you may have you'll also want to make sure that you have a couple units in a back line even if you're a full infantry army so that if one of our core parts of our front line are weakened we can send units up in different positions on the map to support them if one of our flanks is weak or if one of our front lines is weak we can always send a supporting unit up you'll want to have damage dealers or armor piercers usually in the backs here with your anti-larges on the sides and then if anything goes wrong you can always send out those damage dealers to help support your other armies and then if you notice that the enemy army doesn't have a lot of front line you can usually route them around to attack their ranged units or to hammer and anvil them from behind there are a whole lot of other specifics that go into each fight especially with melee based units so not all of that can be covered in this video this is basically just a simple guide to cover the most basic ways of managing your infantry units and determining what sort of composition you're looking for and knowing where to send certain units to so that you're not putting yourself in a really bad position or creating an army full of anti-large against a bunch of infantry units or something like that. It's mostly pretty simple stuff. You create your front line, you have them go up against the enemy front line, and you try to use your supporting units to deal some extra damage and get an advantage over in the fight so that you hopefully win.